What's up everyone, Carlos or Acid Glow here. This video is another collection of alien stories from the comic books, novels and movies. These are older videos that I made in the past, but now they are placed into a single video which is 1 hour and 40 minutes long. So if you prefer to sit through a single long video, this would be good for you. It includes a bunch of stories, so it's an easy way to catch up on topics if you missed the original videos a long time ago. It has topics about the character Eloise, the xenomorph android hybrid, the alien hybrid Indominus, alien Earthbound, the alien 3 sequel we never saw, some topics around Prometheus and Alien Covenant, what happened to Ash after the first alien movie, and a lot more. So I'm going to leave timestamps down below. So that's it, let's begin. What is the story of Eloise? who first appeared in the comic book Alien's Purge. She always knew she was different in some way. She may look human, but she was also something else. During her time, Eloise had built a connection to the xenomorph alien. Her origins would later see her as the mother to monsters. Her time was mostly spent in isolation and containment, resting with other xenomorphs. She was the result of a secret project which was conducted by Dr. Fred Lichner at the Adelm facility. When Colonel Armand Gautier arrived on the planet, he was there to reassess the financial viability of the outpost. A lot of funding was given to Dr. Lichner, so now was the time to show where all the money went. Part of the funding went towards the lepers, which were humans that were impregnated by face huggers. He used a form of leprosy to withhold the alien within the host. This process would then give the host powerful survival instincts. The project did not seem beneficial to Gautier, as the company preferred android development. The lepers were seen as expendable, their future was being used as test subjects, but while they carried the alien life form within their bodies, Eloise would show compassion towards them. Dr. Lichner would later admit that the infecti research was going nowhere, so he showed the colonel where the rest of the funding went. Eloise was more than an android, she was grown using the alien queen's DNA. He infected an alien egg with a biological virus. It also contained leprosy spores as a protective carrier medium. Android morphology is heavily based on silicon polymers, so is the aliens, so it was not difficult to make the adjustment. This results in a stronger, faster android. Because Eloise has the DNA of an alien queen, she has some type of connection to the lepers which carry alien young. They see her as a mother figure. At this point, the colonel was interested in the project, but not in the team developing it. He had them all eliminated, and took Eloise and any data from the computers. The queen alien which was contained on the outpost was also eliminated. As the aliens were screaming out, Eloise felt their pain and suffering. The anger within her forced her other half to come out. The flesh peeled off her fingers to reveal her alien side. She fights back, trying to protect the lepers and aliens. But since she was a prototype, she was never programmed with behavioral inhibitors. The end of the story shows that Gautier was defeated by Eloise and her aliens. She then boards an aircraft with the survivors and leaves the planet. Someday she'll find out what she really is, but not here, not now. All she wants is to protect her friends and her brood. Her story is later continued in the comic book Alien vs Predator Pursuit. We are taken to a court space station called the Adelaide and Bombay Holding Alliance. Captain Lotus Hernandez is asked about her latest mission. Her group was sent to LK-176 to apprehend Eloise, but things did not go as planned. She was also not the only group assigned for this mission. When they landed on the tropical planet, they found hanging bodies, and within seconds, they are attacked by something. A small group of predators were waiting, but the humans were used as bait, meant to lure out Eloise. And this plan actually works. She comes out of hiding and engages the predators. Her brood of xenomorphs follows her, and they defeat the hunters. They overwhelm the predators and are forced to flee. Eloise and her aliens have won, for now. This is when Captain Hernandez sneaks up on Eloise, setting up for a disabling shot. But Eloise's enhanced reflexes kick in. She breaks the arm of Hernandez, and it seems this is where it might end. And to her surprise, Eloise lets Hernandez live. She speaks in a human voice. She wants us to leave her and her people alone. She's tired of running. 
Going from system to system is how she ran into the predators, who now hunt her for their own reasons, but she's had enough and wants to be at peace. She tells them, if you send another group after her, it will be considered an act of war, a war you will not win against her. Even though she was a vat-grown prototype, she was still half android and half alien. She cared for the aliens like a mother. She did not fear the aliens. She loved them. Both stories were written by Ian Eddington. So that covers the story of Eloise. What did you think about it? Tell me in the comment section. So alien hybrids have been explored across various sources. And although not a lot of these hybrids have an everlasting impression, there's been very few hybrids that can lead to a whole new story. Now I've covered fan art before on this channel, and it's mostly from artists that are very talented. So I came across an artist named Ralph Lamotten, and he was able to draw a hybrid of the Indominus Rex from Jurassic World and combine it with a Neomorph from Alien Covenant. And this ended up being called the Indominus Neomorph. So if we combine this dinosaur with the black goo from Prometheus, this is what it could possibly mutate into. This alien is seen to have the pale colored skin, a few spikes on its back and elbows. Although most of its body seem to be fleshy like the standard Neomorph, it also shares the inner jaw design that was taken from the Goblin Shark. Now the Indominus Rex was already a hybrid of many dinosaurs like Carnotosaurus, Giganotosaurus, Majungosaurus, Rugops, Therizinosaurus, Velociraptor, and Tyrannosaurus. And the Neomorph aliens were seen to be more hostile than a normal Xenomorph. So if you combine that with the Indominus Rex's urge to kill anything it sees, it would make an incredibly vicious creature. What's up everyone, Acid Glow here. So I wanted to talk about an article that popped up on a couple of websites recently. It's about a sequel to the Alien 3 movie that was never made. An early draft for the film was called Alien Earthbound. It was written by Stuart Hazeldean, who was a filmmaker and screenwriter. Now the draft was reviewed by Fox, but by that time it was too late because they already approved the script for Alien Resurrection. So because of that, Alien Earthbound was never produced into a film. But there are some details about the movie that give you an idea of the plot and how different it would have been to Alien Resurrection. Hazel Dean starts off by saying he was aware the fans wanted to know what would happen when the aliens reached Earth. So he wrote a story around that idea and even brought back Ripley as a clone. But this time, he would not include her alien DNA like it was done in Resurrection. Ripley was supposed to team up with UN troops to stop the aliens from reaching Earth. There was supposed to be a giant space station that was attached to Earth by an 80 mile long tube which could be seen as a space elevator that led to Antarctica. It was also going to include a look at the alien homeworld when explorers would come across the alien pyramids and some of them would get face hugged. When they returned to their ship, they gave birth to chest bursters, and the ship is then put into autopilot mode as it drifts until it reaches a space station. From here, the aliens would board it and would start to make their way down the space elevator towards Earth. In 72 hours, the aliens would reach Earth and would scatter everywhere. So the question is, how do you stop the aliens? They were not able to blow up the space station because that would send debris towards Earth and it might poison the atmosphere. So a team of military engineers is sent to the center of the space station to plant a few air bomb. This would incinerate the space station from within and be more environmental friendly. Because Ripley had knowledge of the xenomorphs, she was cloned to help them. At first she refuses, but then she learns about her granddaughter, Ellen McLaren, who is around 20 years old, but she ends up dying in the movie. After Ripley realizes she's lost so many people close to her, she comes around and helps the UN troops in their mission. When they board the space station, they find out the aliens have infected a colony of genetically engineered jumping spiders that were created for pest control, and the center of the space station where the bomb has to be planted is right in the middle of the spider alien's nest. Ripley comes up with a plan to distract the Xeno spiders so her team can get in and plant the bomb. There were some other things mentioned, like another bishop, some old characters returning, and even a side story of who the clone Ripley really was. The draft for the movie was actually going to be considered in some way. An executive at Fox told him that if there was enough time, he wanted to take the best ideas from his script and include them into Alien Resurrection so it would be a better movie. But by that time, Alien Resurrection was already in post-production, so it was too late. Now the things I would have liked about this script was bringing back Ripley, 
having another bishop and seeing returning characters in some way. I'm not too fond of the idea of jumping spider aliens, but who knows, maybe they could have pulled it off. But aside from having aliens reach Earth, what I really wanted to see is a film about the alien homeworld. So what do you think about the idea around Alien Earthbound? Would it have been a better film compared to Alien Resurrection? Let me know in the comments section. What's up everyone, Glow here. So we have some information about Alien Covenant and some of the questions surrounding the movie. Now in a recent interview with Yahoo Movies, Ridley Scott sat down and gave us some answers to these questions. So if you have not seen the movie yet, let this be your warning for incoming spoilers. So the first question was about why James Franco got such a small role in the movie. He's a big star in Hollywood, yet his time on screen was very limited. Now James Franco was fully aware of his character already having a small role in the film, but he still wanted to do it. Now there was another scene that was filmed but did not make it into the movie. It goes into the relationship between Branson and Daniels and they're deciding what they're going to do later on in their lives. Now they plan to live in a house by a lake together and the scene was actually explained during a time they spend together in their apartment. Now Ridley Scott has said this scene might be inserted into the DVD and Blu-ray version. Now the next question was on why David killed everyone on the engineer planet. Now at this point in the film, David already disliked humanity. He saw humans as inadequate and wanted to get rid of them. He also thought the same thing about the engineers, since the engineers created the humans who are violent and could not be controlled. They also posed a threat to the engineers and other life forms. So he had to get rid of both species, and after this event, he was left alone. So up next is a big question on why David created the Xenomorph. Now after the engineers were killed off on Paradise, David was alone, so he took up the art of drawing to pass the time. Then he went into construction, and later on he got into the idea of creating life forms. So he used the black goo seen in Prometheus and mixed it with human DNA to create a new alien. Now he might have used Shaw's DNA for some of his experiments. Now the Neomorphs were a new type of alien in the movie, and they took up a good amount of time on film. When asked about the purpose of them in the movie, Ridley Scott said they were added just for entertainment. He wanted to use them as a distraction and not show too much of the actual Xenomorph. He felt that if the Xenomorph took up too much time in the film, then it wouldn't be scary or mysterious. Now the movie used quite a bit of CGI for its visual effects that were meant to enhance some scenes. When asked why they used that much CGI for the alien and Neomorph scenes, Ridley Scott responded by saying he now prefers CGI over the old effects of a man in a rubber suit. He felt that some things would be better portrayed in CGI because it gives him more freedom. So with Alien Covenant being a sequel to Prometheus, a lot of fans were left wondering if it answered any questions we had since the first Alien movie. Perhaps yes, in some ways, but according to the original script of Prometheus, there were a lot of differences that would have answered many questions in one movie. So the original movie was titled Alien Engineers and was written by John Spates. Now this story actually answered some questions, but this underwent many changes and it just made things more confusing and it left us with more questions when Prometheus was completed. Now Peter Whelan's role was a little bit different in the original script. They planned to terraform Mars, but in order to do that, they would need the engineer's technology. So Peter Whelan never takes his journey and ultimately never meets the engineers. Now the reason for this change was because Peter Wayland was seeing himself as a god early on in the script. So instead of meeting the creators of mankind, he planned to terraform other moons and planets. Now he has a conversation with Shaw and he says this, What does God spend his time doing? God created civilization on earth. And this is the reason for the terraforming mission in the original script. Another change they made was even though the final version of the movie had its ship called Prometheus, it did not really connect to the actual meaning of how Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind. Now the original script mentions that the reason the ship is called Prometheus is because it was supposed to be a mission about taking engineer technology and bring it back to humanity so we could use it, which is a much better depiction of the story that took place on Mount Olympus. Now after Prometheus, David ended up taking control of the engineer ship and technology. He later goes on to kill the engineers on Paradise, and in some sense, this scene can be linked to another part of the Greek story where Zeus says he will not share a spark of fire with mankind, because if man had fire, they could become strong like gods and drive them out of their kingdom. And this is what happens after the Prometheus movie. So even though that does connect in some way, 
it's not the same as the original terraforming mission. Another change was that Holloway was the original host for the Deacon Alien, which was supposed to happen when him and Shaw were having sex, which I can see would be a much more gruesome and horrifying experience. So in the movie, David betrayed his team when he put the black goo inside Holloway's drink, so it wasn't really clear what made him do this, but in the original script it was explained that during the time his crew were in hypersleep, David spent years learning trinary code, and it was this code that changed him in some way. It allowed him to think for himself, to become curious, and to break free of Wayland's control. Although he was programmed to be a little bit different than other models, it was this code that assisted in him becoming more independent. Now it was also mentioned that the ending was different. Since Shaw learned that David was untrustworthy, instead of repairing his body, she decides to stay on the planet because she knows David betrayed everyone, so she could not take the risk by repairing him, which is a much more sensible decision for a human. And the last thing in the original script that really connects Prometheus to Alien was the last surviving engineer. Now the original script mentions that this engineer had lost control of his cargo of alien eggs. Then there was a breach somewhere, and at least one facehugger was loose on this ship. As it was trying to protect its race, he got impregnated, and since it knew it was going to die, he put himself in hypersleep. Then when he is awoken by the humans, he kills David and tries to leave the moon. But this is when the chestburster erupts and it kills him. Then the ship crashes on what we know as LV-426 and that is how everyone finds out who the space jockey was. Now, although some parts of the original script give us the answers we wanted, it's possible this was changed to give Ridley Scott a chance to continue the storyline with more movies in the future. But, there were some articles that mentioned Ridley Scott did not agree with some things in the original script, and that's also why it was changed into what we got in Prometheus. The story of the first Alien movie introduced us to a crew aboard the Nostromo, Coming back from a routine mission, their ship picks up a signal from the planet LV-426. Per company orders, the ship has gone off course in search of the signal. When the crew awakens from hypersleep, they expect to be close to home, but they are not. They learn that they are far from their families and loved ones. Not only that, but the ship's AI mainframe brought them to LV-426. It was in the company's best interest to investigate any possible extraterrestrial life forms, and since the Nostromo was nearby, they were chosen for this mission. As the story unfolds, Ash, the science officer, was actually an android sent by the company. He was to watch over the actions of the crew and report back to Whalen Yutani. When a team was sent out to the planet to uncover the source of the signal, they encountered an alien life form. It infected one of the crew members and would later burst from its chest. The unknown life form was small during birth, but would later grow larger than a human. Ash was secretly ordered to follow Special Order 937, Priority 1, ensure return of organism for analysis, all other considerations secondary, crew expendable. When Ash tried to attack Ripley, he was subdued by other crew members. His body was then destroyed, and the crew was left on their own. By the end of the story, Ripley was the last remaining survivor of the Nostromo. She then escaped in the emergency shuttle and was left drifting through space. While the story ended here, Ash was mentioned in other sources. There was an audiobook and a novel with the story that took place between the two movies. Alien Out of the Shadows is about a crew aboard the Marion. They come across Ripley's shuttle and wake her up, along with her cat Jones only for her to find out that aliens are on the planet LV-178 and the mining vessel, which is in orbit. Ripley is taken back to the Narcissus, which is the shuttle she was found in, but when she tries to get information from the shuttle's log, she is locked out from everything. It's later revealed that Ash uploaded his AI consciousness inside the Narcissus. He continues to obey Special Order 937. He later infects the Marion, attempting to acquire more alien specimens, but at the cost of losing human lives. The crew plans to escape in Ripley's shuttle by taking turns in a single hypersleep pod every six months. It's the only way to survive before passing away from old age. As the team tries to plan their escape, their efforts are delayed when Ash takes control of everything, but he is finally wiped from the mainframe with a powerful computer virus. Ripley ends up getting injured and placed in a med pod to treat her wounds. She also requests to have her memory wiped of recent events. 
As a last resort before he was terminated, Ash sabotaged the shuttle's automatic docking release. The only way to close it is from within the Marion. This is when Hoop steps into the Marion to launch Ripley's shuttle into space. When she wakes up, she will not remember what happened. Ripley would continue drifting into space until the events of Aliens, the second movie. But that's not the last time the android Ash was mentioned. During the comic book and novel story of Aliens The Female War, also known as Aliens Earth War, a synthetic clone of Ripley is brought into the story. She learns that Will Nutani knew all along about the alien creature. Kane's helmet had recorded everything. Even when the company denied everything, it was all a lie. The suits they wore had built-in recording devices. The Nostromo's android Ash had dumped the data into the escape pod's computer. This happened long before he attacked Ripley, so Willy Nutani already knew what happened. The story of this Ripley took place after the second movie Aliens, but they still had some information of Ash. The rest of the story is related to going back to Acheron, also known as LV-426. What is the trilobite creature seen in the movie Prometheus? Now its origins are much different than a normal face hugger. When the Prometheus ship and its crew had landed on LV-223, the team investigated a nearby temple that was created by the engineers, and a massive spacecraft along with its dangerous cargo were found underneath the same temple. During the time the Prometheus crew explored this area, they came across a decapitated body of an engineer, and when the android David-8 opened the door containing the head of the dead engineer. The same room inside also contained many vases, and each one contained steatite ampules that carried a mutagenic accelerant known as the black goo, or chemical A0-3959X.91-15. This chemical would mutate a life form upon contact. David 8 was curious to see what would happen if a human was exposed to this chemical, and so he intentionally put a drop of it into Holloway's drink. And later on that evening, Holloway would have intercourse with Elizabeth Shaw. This would then affect Shaw's reproductive abilities to bear children, something she could not do naturally, and the creature growing inside her abnormal fetus was the trilobite. At first, it would appear as a bulge around the stomach area. This could mean that its natural method of exiting a host would be through the stomach, and through a painful and quick process, Shaw was able to remove it and save her life. Now its physical traits seemed to resemble a squid with four arms, and even in its infant stages, it was shown to be aggressive. Shaw would try to kill the creature by decontaminating the med pod that was used for surgery, although this only rendered it unconscious. Now, it would be seen later on when an engineer hunts down Elizabeth Shaw in a lifeboat, which was a separate craft from the Prometheus ship. When the two of them meet, Shaw tries to fight back, but the engineer overpowers her, and in a desperate attempt, she opens the door to the med bay, and a massive trilobite emerges. With the little time it had after being removed from Shaw's body, it had a very rapid growing process. Now, as the engineer struggles to fight this creature, its enlarged tentacles wrap around him, pulling him closer as smaller tentacles come out and attach to the victim's head. It assists in restraining the engineer as a tube emerges from its mouth, which is surrounded by teeth. This would then implant a Deacon embryo within the engineer. And during this process, the victim is then put into an unconscious state. Now at the back of the trilobite, you can see a few holes. It's possible these are used for breathing, or to pass air into the host to keep them alive. And the final stage of this process would result in a Deacon alien emerging from the chest of the engineer. Now, its design was based off the Octo Facehugger, which was cut from Prometheus during early production, and in the original script of Alien Engineers, it was the Octo Facehugger that impregnated Holloway. So what did you think of the trilobite when you first saw it in Prometheus? Let me know in the comments section. What if a Pred alien was using Predator technology? What's up everyone, Carlos here. So I wanted to cover two scenes that never made it into the final version of this movie, Alien vs Predator Requiem. Now when it comes to deleted scenes, they are sometimes reinserted into the film for the unrated or director's cut version, as a way of explaining a story with more content that was cut from the theatrical version. And in some cases, these deleted scenes are never reinserted due to production costs, or perhaps a change to the script, or some other reason. But one deleted scene was pretty interesting. After the Pred alien was born, it would go on to kill some hunters on the ship. Then as it crashes, 
it would continue to skin their bodies and hang them upside down before it escapes into the nearby town and enters the sewers. But then later on, Wolf Predator comes to Earth and reaches the crashed ship. He comes across the skinned bodies of the two predators who were killed. They were hung upside down and their feet were attached by some type of alien resin, and below them he would find their weapons. This idea was later used in the AVP Requiem premium trading cards, which gave information about the characters and the scenes in the movie. The Pred alien was supposed to skin other victims as a way of showing it still carried that memory which was part of the predator hunting rituals. This deleted scene was never reinserted back into the movie, but some production stills of this scene can be found in the book by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. The book was called AVPR Inside the Monster Shop. There was even some information indicating that the Pred alien was even going to use a predator technology like the wrist blades, plasma caster, and the stealth camouflage, but this idea was later removed. Now although these two scenes did not make it into the film, I actually thought the idea of skin predators sounded pretty cool. It would have given the Pred alien a closer connection to its predator bloodline instead of just having the mandibles and dreadlocks. But as for the idea of seeing it use predator technology, I did not like that one because that would make it look less like an animal. The story of Alien vs Predator Requiem took place right after the first movie. When Scar Predator died after defeating the Queen Alien, his clan came to pick up his body. It was taken aboard their ship and as they left Earth, the Pred Alien was born. Now the Pred Alien would go on to take characteristics of both the Predator and the Xenomorph. Having a hard exoskeleton body, an inner jaw, mandibles, and a voice very different from the two species. Now I was watching the extra features on Blu-ray and they mention the Pred Alien was originally not supposed to be in the film for a long time. Now an original version of the draft showed the Pred Alien was supposed to die on page 3. So that seems like the movie at that time would have focused on the Predator cleaning up the town of the Xenomorph infestation. But that draft was later altered so the hybrid would be a great nemesis for the Predator in the entire movie. The Pred Alien was also supposed to be kept a secret during production. It was renamed to Chet, so if the script had leaked out, nobody would know there was a Pred Alien or a hybrid until official details were released. This Pred Alien was even listed as a baby queen. Since it was a hybrid, they also had to change its method of embryo implantation. The normal queen alien would lay eggs which carried facehuggers. They would find a host and impregnate them with an alien embryo. But the Pred Alien was given a new way to produce more aliens. It would use its mandibles to clamp onto a host and its mouth would transport the embryo. But this implantation would result in belly bursters. The Pred Alien would mostly target pregnant women because that would result in multiple aliens being born at once. The head of the Pred Alien was a combination of a predator's skull with a transparent dome similar to what was seen in the first Alien movie. Although its physical appearance was around 85% alien, it was shown to still have a personality trait of the Predator. One thing that is so common about these hunters is their interest in ripping out the spines of their victims. The Predators hold the skulls as trophies of their victories. Now there was a scene in the restaurant that lasts for about 2 seconds, but if you pause it, you can see the Pred Alien ripping out the spine of its victim. This scene was also shown in photographs where you can see how it was planned out. The design of the Pred Alien also went through different phases. They changed its head, crest, dreadlocks, the spikes on its back, and the body type. But one design showed its entire foreskin rolling back from its face. I'm not sure what the purpose was other than to scare its victim, but it did look pretty cool. So those are some details about the Pred Alien in AVP Requiem. Which AVP movie did you like the most? Put it down in the comments section. Is it possible for a facehugger to impregnate another xenomorph? Before we look into this question, we need to explore various types of xenomorph strains. The xenomorph is seen as the perfect organism. Through adaptation and survival traits at a genetic level, its body temperature matches the same level as its surroundings, allowing it to survive in almost any environment. From its hard skeletal body, which acts as light body armor, it can withstand light firearms. 
If the xenomorph would sustain any injury, it doesn't mean that it is any closer to losing a battle. Because its acid blood has been known to spill over its enemies and burn their flesh away, their blood is so strong that it can melt through metallic materials. This creature is known to have no remorse, no sense of morality. It simply wants to survive or to expand its ever-growing brood. The various forms we have come across are all dependent on their host. A xenomorph will acquire some physical traits on who the host is. A human host will result in a standard drone. This one has been seen in most films, video games, and novels. It is the one we are most familiar with. However, the comic books have been known to change its appearance over time. Some of these would be based on the artist or writer having their own vision of the alien's biology. A predator host would give us the pred alien. However, its design has changed slightly over the different sources. In some cases, it appeared as a fleshy pred alien, but its build has been either bulky or slender, depending on the material source. While in other versions, it would have the standard skeletal frame, along with spiky features on its tail. The dreadlocks and mandibles would be a trait passed down by the predator. There's been some cases where a facehugger impregnates various other life forms, like birds, rhinos, elephants, snakes, and more. Most of the xenomorphs we've seen throughout different sources have had a general similarity, but with minor differences. But what extreme species have we seen? Well, in the film Prometheus, the trilobite creature acted just like a normal facehugger, although it was a lot bigger. The host chosen for this story was an engineer, which led to the creation of the Deacon Alien. The comic book about Batman vs. Aliens did contain a crocodile alien. Compared to the many other variants of the xenomorph, this alien type was pretty big. The second comic book about Batman Aliens 2 also had another variation of a crocodile alien, but this one was created by using Killer Croc as a host. Both of these crocodile aliens were defeated by Batman fairly quickly. If we look at the comic book story called Aliens Apocalypse, The Destroying Angels, it's a story about how xenomorphs were around for billions of years. The xenomorphs were at war with another alien species. They resembled the space jockey in some way, and for a long time they were taking control of the galaxy, but they were wiped out by the xenomorph at some time, except for one of them, which was left in catatonic suspension. They were on the verge of extinction, so this one tried to outlast the xenomorphs this way. In one scene, a synthetic named Ball takes an alien egg to impregnate a being that survived all this time. It gives birth to the largest xenomorph ever seen. This creature is massive, and it attacked other aliens. It wasn't defeated by the humans. They just escaped in a ship while it was left behind. So, now that we've seen different xenomorph types, let's get back to the main question. Can a facehugger impregnate another xenomorph? One very rare case where I've seen this is in the comic book about Aliens vs Predator, Deadliest of the Species. There were 12 issues from 1993 until 1995. The story was very long, but also very confusing. The story includes many characters, but the focus is on Karen de la Croix, She's been genetically engineered with specific physical, psychological, and emotional parameters to be a trophy wife to Lucien de la Croix. For the longest time, she's had dreams from a life she never experienced herself. She sees a predator that is always stalking her, saying the name Ash Parnell. Karen would live aboard the Skyliner, a floating ship that remains in the sky. The skies were the safest place for them, this takes place after Earth has been liberated from the Xenomorphs. The central mainframe is monitored and controlled by Toy. He's basically the artificial intelligence to everything he can connect to. Karen would later track down the Predator, knowing it's linked to her past in some way. By using its biomask and voice commands, an internal hologram is shown. It leads her to the Predator. We are then shown the Predator that is hunting Karen. It's been captured when it hunted Karen in Central America. Plans are being arranged to transfer this creature to another research lab. It's also revealed this predator is female. Karen would locate the female predator and a gunfight ensues during her escape. 
They locate the predator's ship and take to the stars. She places the female predator into a pod, letting her rest to heal her injuries. Aboard the predator's ship, Karen finds a separate room. She finds a picture and clothing that could belong to someone else. Karen remains in the room, trying to piece together what her dreams and memories could mean. She feels lost, trying to find an answer. This is also when Karen decides to call the female predator Big Mama. Professor Bobby DeMattier would then use Willem, the son of Lucien Delacroix, as a host for a new type of queen alien. They were partners once, but after they hit a roadblock with producing alien drones, they now require a queen. Willem suddenly wakes up, thinking it was just a dream, but little does he know he is part of a grand scheme. Later in the story, Karen gets captured by men in a bar. They try to change her appearance and sell her for profit, but she escapes and later tracks down the queen mother alien who has captured Maria and Big Mama. Karen ends up sacrificing herself in order to save Maria and Big Mama. She becomes a royal host. This bargain means a lot to the queen mother because this egg is the last one in her possession. Karen thinks the queen mother will be their protector as long as she carries the embryo within her. She explains that Bobby DeMattier was a xenogeneticist. He wanted to use eugenics to create specialized subjects of humanity, the perfect spaceman, the ultimate warrior, adaptable to any climate and condition. Some time later, the surviving humans that sided with Karen would get trained by Big Mama and become worthy to wear predator armor and weaponry. The reason Big Mama wanted revenge was because her children were stolen from her. Along with the Queen Mother Alien, all three species worked together for one goal, to find Bobby DeMattier and stop his plans. And as for the Queen Mother, it's revealed that her other eggs were also stolen. As they return to the Skyliner, the entire place has turned into an alien nest. They locate Lucien de la Croix, who is now hooked up to a cellular skull lap. He is now connected to the mainframe, which is Toy. They are then attacked by these white alien creatures, something very new to them, but they also show intelligence in using human weapons and communicating through speech. When this encounter is over, the embryo within Karen de la Croix starts to emerge. Before she expires, Karen learns that the true enemy is Toy, the AI who is now corrupted. Karen's past is then explained in full. Another version of herself was with Lucian on an expedition a very long time ago. They were searching for treasure, but instead they found Toy, a revolutionary interactive computer system. But within, they also encountered a queen mother. Karen would get injured and scream for help from Lucian. Knowing that he could not save her, he decided to leave behind the person he loved and run away with his prize. Toy would later become the foundation of Lucian's fortune, starting out with games, movies, and then virtual reality. Bobby DeMatte later gets taken out by the Queen Mother who escapes captivity. She runs off with one last egg, but they are all captured later on by something else. After Toy became corrupted, he surpassed Bobby DeMatte's dreams. With no safeguard to hold Toy back, he created the white hybrid aliens and their king. He spoke with the voice of Willem de la Croix. These hybrids were a brutal synthesis of human, predator, and alien. They were cunning, intelligent, and ferocious, the comprehension of the ultimate warrior. The alien that came out of Karen de la Croix's body would show up to battle the white hybrid king. This new alien teams up with Big Mama, and together they fight against the white hybrid king. The queen mother, who has been impregnated, awakens and pulls off the face hugger. Knowing she is doomed, she makes one final effort in helping the others. She holds the white hybrid king from behind. As the chestburster emerges, it exits her body and goes through the king as well. Both of them are eliminated, and the chestburster is destroyed by Big Mama. Karen would then get revived as Ash Parnell. Lucien de la Croix is destroyed, which cuts off his connection to Toy. The survivors go their separate ways, and the story ends. So, there's your answer. Xenomorphs can become a host to facehuggers, but we can only imagine what its full-grown form would have looked like. The character named Ash Parnell was from the story Aliens Renegade. 
it was listed as a prequel to Aliens vs. Predator, deadliest of the species. However, it was only featured in a UK magazine for two issues in 1993 and 1994, and since then, it was never reprinted again, so that story is very hard to acquire. What is the Dark Alien? It was featured in the comic book about Witchblade, Aliens, Darkness, and Predator. The Dark Alien was created by a facehugger attaching itself to a Darkling. They were the small creatures summoned by the supernatural powers of the Darkness, which was controlled by Jackie Estacado. The Dark Alien had all the powers of the Darkness, along with having the traits of a Xenomorph and Darkling. It still retained its acid blood, hard exoskeleton on some parts of the body, while the rest were fleshy, and the classic inner jaw could be seen inside its mouth. Now during a battle against Jackie Estacado and Sarah, it suffered many injuries, but because of the darkness powers, it was able to heal its wounds quickly. Its face would resemble the Darkling, while its entire body was rather small in size. Its back two legs would bend in different positions when it leapt in the air or scaled on the walls. The Dark Alien did have some darkness powers, but it could not be controlled by Jackie. It would attack anyone, as it showed hostility towards Sarah and Jackie. Although the Dark Alien proved to give our two heroes a lot of trouble, they could not kill it, but instead they had to trap it inside an airlock. It would later return to control the darkness powers and was even stronger now. It was slowed down when a female predator named Sister Midnight got a hold of the Witchblade for a short time. She stabbed the dark alien and it exploded. Although it was still able to regenerate, it would then die when the self-destruct device from Sister Midnight destroyed the spacecraft that it was on. Although it made a short appearance, seeing the dark alien control the darkness powers was pretty cool. The Xenomorph, a creature found within the deepest parts of the galaxy. Throughout time and space, no man has seen true horror until it discovered this alien creature. This being has no pity, no remorse, no sense of morality. It is linked to a web of a hive mind, ruled by the all-powerful Queen Mother. This species would be seen on various worlds. It has no sympathy, no reasoning, or fear. It lives to protect and expand its species. Cunning, adaptable, and ferocious. It is the perfect organism. The comic book character Judge Dredd has a very extensive background, which expands into video games, movies, and novels. He has a very large fan base and is popular in his own demographic amongst other comic book heroes. Dredd is highly trained and well armed for his task in law enforcement. Judges are tasked with keeping Mega City 1 from falling into crime and chaos. Judge Dredd has a large amount of stories about him. I did cover one specific time when he fought against a predator. The story was really well done with an epic ending. There was also Judge Dredd vs Predator vs Aliens. So I thought I'd go back and cover the story of Judge Dredd vs Aliens. It was a story spread over four issues and released in 2003. Now, before we get started, if you like these kinds of videos, then leave a like on it. I'll cover more topics like this in the future. The story opens up with a traffic jam, and protesters who are against the plans of a new power tower in the south sector of Mega City 1. Drilling has begun into the Earth's crust, extracting the planet's own energy to fuel the towering future of Megalopolis. Judge Dredd appears nearby to break up the people causing this disturbance. But amongst the crowd, a low-level crook named Jimmy Godber is seen running towards Eisenhower Hospital. Carlos Lenning, an anti-judicial activist, is chasing him and asking, where are the other alien eggs? Judge Dredd orders him to drop his weapon, but he refuses and is eliminated by Dredd. Meanwhile, Jimmy is taken to the nearest hospital. A chestburster emerges from his body and escapes into the ventilation system, and so a verminator squad is called in. As they investigate Jimmy's room, they find a keycard that leads them to a warehouse. 
It turns out Jimmy was involved in illegal pit fighting, so they leave his home and head towards the warehouse. Once inside, they look around to find another body, victim to a chestburster as well. An alien egg is located nearby, and it attacks Judge Brubaker. Out of desperation, they react quickly, but without realizing the consequences. A judge tries to cut a finger on the facehugger, only for the acid blood to burn at their fingers. The team gets ambushed by an alien, only for Dread to follow it and discover it has acid for blood. They suffer many casualties and lose control of the situation. They assume Godber was going to use these aliens for illegal pit fights. Back at the hospital, the Verminator squad is already losing members to a full-grown alien. The judges rush back to help them. Dread ends up fighting the alien alone and defeats it. Back in the Grand Hall of Justice, Brubaker's body is examined with the facehugger still attached to him. They discover the tube in its throat feeds him oxygen and it transports an embryo into his body. They've tried to remove the facehugger but with no luck, so they decided to wait, but hopefully not for too long. With Jimmy Godber and Carlos Lenning, also known as Jeremiah, not being alive to give them information, the only lead they have is the accomplice who was with Jeremiah at the time. They start to look for Frank Rim, aka Footsie. When they find him, they will find their answers. The suspect in question escaped to the Undercity, where he meets up with Mr. Bones, the man behind this big plan. As a child, Mr. Bones had mutant genes and a predisposition to acts of evil. Because of this, he was exiled to the Undercity. As he grew older, he became a space pirate. He traveled the galaxy to make his fortune anywhere he could find it. He discovered alien eggs somewhere, and one encounter ended up in his face getting severely burned. But he would later admire the alien. They were merciless, so perfectly designed for the art of killing. While he leads Footsie further down below, an alien hive is shown. Lots of eggs and aliens ready for an attack. Mr. Bones would use a pheromone tag to confuse the aliens. This would prevent them from harming him. And for his failure in retrieving the stolen egg from Godber, Footsie is given to the aliens. Mr. Bones had placed charges right underneath the Grand Hall of Justice. The explosion would create an opening, but without damaging the aliens in any way. His army of aliens is given the name of Incubus. Without any warning, a rumble is felt, and an explosion occurs in the lower levels of the Grand Hall of Justice. The aliens have begun their attack. They encounter the judges, and a battle between the two sides occurs. Back in the operating room, Judge Brubaker gets the chestburster removed from his body, but his vital signs start to drop. Things get worse when the chestburster attacks and gets loose. Judge Giant would activate four Mechanismo droids. They provide additional firepower during the alien attack. With their help, the aliens are repelled back into the hole from which they came. As the aliens retreat, they grab a hold of the new recruit, Judge Sanchez. Her comrades do not risk firing, as the alien's acid blood would endanger Sanchez. With time running out, Dread makes the decision to find Sanchez and save her. He makes his way into the hive to see the problem is bigger than he expected. Without any warning, he is ambushed by a group of facehuggers. When he awakens, Dread and Sanchez are hung from the ceiling, trapped by some kind of resin. This could just be the end of the judges. Mr. Bones would show up, and during their conversation, Dread would take his pheromone tag and crush it. With no protection from the aliens, they turn on Mr. Bones. Reinforcements would enter the Undercity, and a firefight occurs between the judges and mutants. The judges would claim the pheromone tags from them to keep the aliens at bay. Dread would break free of his confines. He and Sanchez would venture into the hive, trying to find an exit only to come across the queen alien. Their only plan now is to shoot their way out. Their top priority now is to get Sanchez topside. She and Dredd have been impregnated, so they don't have much time. The judges plan to arm a nuke to use on the alien hive, but the droid carrying it gets destroyed. While the others escape, Sanchez stays with Dredd. If she was going to die, she might as well go down fighting. 
They shoot at the tubes of lava, but it's reinforced with plasteel. They cannot penetrate the outer layer. It seems they are out of options. But just then, Packer would show up and slam an alien into the outer casing. Its acid blood melts through it, and lava starts pouring out. Knowing that Packer has no chance to survive, Dredd and Sanchez make their way out. Lava pours into the lower levels of the hive, and it destroys any leftover aliens and eggs. Packer's sacrifice was how they saved the city. She will always be remembered. Dredd and Sanchez would later get the embryos removed from their bodies. The aliens grew to full size in a matter of hours. The last thing Dredd wants is to make sure they are all eliminated, and without hesitation, he destroys these two aliens. The end. So that's the story of Judge Dredd versus Aliens. A rather interesting story. And I did like how they showed Dredd in a moment of vulnerability. It wasn't a complete one-sided battle, and throwing in Mr. Bones, who knew about the aliens, was a nice addition. The Xenomorph, seen as the perfect organism. Its body is armored with an exoskeleton, and various parts of its body can be used as weapons, like the claws, tail, and inner jaw. This unique creature can also scale the walls on all fours as it tracks down its prey. It is silent, cunning, and lethal. The xenomorph's biological makeup allows it to survive in almost any environment, and their hive is ruled by a single queen alien. The life cycle of the xenomorph starts off as an egg, also known as the ovomorph. It carries a parasitic life form called a facehugger, which implants an embryo into a living organism. The embryo would then grow inside a host until it forms into a chest burster. When it reaches a certain length, it will burst out of the host, killing them in the process. As the chest burster matures, it will grow into a full-grown adult alien. Throughout its entire lifespan, the xenomorph will have a unique attribute to its blood. It would appear as a yellowish-green color, but also have the quality of being extremely corrosive. This molecular fluid was classified as a fluoroantimonic acid. It can burn through almost anything, which is why it's known as a super acid. One chemical that does not get affected by the acid is called polytetrafluorothylene, also known as Teflon. It is a common thing found in non-stick frying pans. A container coated with this chemical will be the best way to transport the super acid. When you look at the physical adaptations of the xenomorph body, it seems to inherit some traits of the host, either from a human, predator, or any other creature. One interesting aspect of the xenomorph blood is how it became far less acidic when the host came from a predator. The pred alien in the movie AVP Requiem did not seem to have the highly corrosive blood that the standard xenomorph has. This trait was passed down by the predator blood having special properties. The combination of their DNA led to a hybrid that was mostly alien, but with some traits taken from a predator. Now the runner xenomorph that appeared in Alien 3 would still retain the highly corrosive acid blood, even though it came from a dog or ox. The xenomorph's blood was so strong that it would burn very quickly through steel and iron. Explosive weapons would result in their acid blood splashing everywhere, causing more damage in a wider range. In the Alien vs Predator universe, the Yautua species would hunt the xenomorphs during their trials. Some of their weapons would be immune to the alien's acid blood. Whaling Yutani would also create the ape suit, which was supposed to provide some level of protection from the corrosive acid effects. Since this substance is mostly known as the xenomorph blood, there are some clues hinting that it's not really their blood. The novelization of Alien mentions that during the facehugger stage, this fluid is kept under pressure between a double layer of skin. This is why the acid substance tends to spurt out when the outer layer is ruptured. During a documentary of AVP Requiem, they mentioned this fluid could also be listed as a hydrosulfuric acid because of its toxic effects on living tissue. Ron Cobb, who worked on the first Alien movie, also suggested that it's mainly used as a defensive mechanism so the attacker would not dare kill the xenomorph. This also brings up the topic of its diet. During the events of Aliens on LV-426, many bodies were seen to be used as hosts for facehuggers. This could imply that xenomorphs have very little use for sustenance. 
Some research done by La Salle Bionational discovered that the acid is primarily a component of a biological battery. It generates a powerful bioelectric charge by the means of chemical reaction. This gives the xenomorph the energy it needs. This would replace the need for a normal respiratory and digestion system. It might be linked as to why the xenomorphs spend so much time in a dormant state. They mostly leave the hive to find suitable hosts for future facehuggers. The runner seen in Alien 3 was seen to attack an inmate viciously. Some might take this as a feeding scene. But in the comic book of Alien's Labyrinth, Dr. Paul Church conducts some tests on a captured xenomorph. This subject was starved for a long time and is then presented with a pig, which for some reason they are very fond of, and also a target who is armed that could injure it. The xenomorph would choose to attack an enemy before it would find a food source. They fight for the survival of their species and don't consider themselves as individuals. Since we barely see a xenomorph eating, it's possible that they require very little food. If they eat too much food in a weakened state, it turns out it could lead to their death for some reason. One of the early versions of the alien script also mentions that the xenomorph was originally going to eat human food. It would break into the food storage area to feed off anything it could find. It then gets spotted by two crew members and one of them asks how did it get so big and the other person responds with by eating our food supplies. After this, the xenomorph would escape into a ventilation shaft. The xenomorph body itself is also immune to the corrosive acid effects. Perhaps it has a thin layer of a protective chemical. This is similar to how humans are not affected by the acid in their stomach because our stomach walls are covered in a layer of mucus. In AVP Requiem, the wolf predator used a blue liquid on the xenomorphs. It had very similar burning effects. And also, during the novels that took place on LV-178, they mentioned that hydrofluoric acid was effective against the xenomorph. The facehugger in the first Alien movie was able to spit acid to melt the helmet that Kane was wearing. This allowed it to access Kane's face afterwards. The acid spit was also shown in Alien 3, Alien 4 Resurrection, Aliens Colonial Marines, and the Praetorian in Alien vs Predator from 2010. Ripley 8 who was a clone of Ellen Ripley had some xenomorph DNA inside her when she was created. Her blood had some corrosive properties but not as strong as the xenomorph's blood. For the longest time, many companies have tried to uncover the secrets of the xenomorph's biology. They wanted to create special vaccines or miracle drugs. But their highly corrosive blood would be a problem during surgery. So they would drain the body of fluids and as a matter of precaution, they would suspend them in a powerful agent that would counteract its acidic properties. The final thing that I want to mention is that during the first Alien movie, Dan O'Bannon insisted that the creature be a mortal being, but it had to have a special characteristic that prevented the crew from killing it. What happened to the colonists and aliens? So during this movie, the story leads up to where Ellen Ripley awakens from hypersleep after 57 years. And later on, she is employed by the company that found her. She takes her place aboard the space station while having nightmares of the alien she fought on the Nostromo. During this time, she learns about how alien Yutani has started terraforming planets, and in the process, they have sent down plenty of families with workers that took part in this procedure. They were all sent down to the planet LV-426. When they lose communications with everyone on LV-426, the company asks Ripley to assist the colonial marines as they investigate the situation. But as the story unfolds, we learn that the majority of the colonists were captured and taken to the high for incubation. Now, there were some small details left out from this event that were not explained in the movie. These events were later explored in a comic book about Newt. The story picks up right after Newt's father is face-hugged and taken back to base. There's a scene where Newt watches her father die after being implanted with a xenomorph embryo. They even send in their own security team to investigate the growing hive, but they get killed off. Then, the aliens make their way to the facility, and a lot of people get killed and taken away to the hive. The survivors try to barricade all the entrances, and Newt's mother gets a hold of a gun to protect her children. Then, as the facility becomes an unsafe area, the security staff try to move the civilians to a safer place. With more xenomorphs being born from facehuggers, the survivors stick together until the colonial marines arrive. As the aliens begin to enter the facility, Newt's mother carries her children away, and in an attempt to save them, she pushes them into the ventilation system, but she gets killed by an alien, and Timmy grabs the pistol dropped by his mother and shoots. The alien's acid blood sprays onto him, 
and he is then picked up and killed by an alien as well. And due to her small size, Newt used it as a benefit to fit into places the aliens could not follow her. She runs away and learns to hide and survive alone, watching the xenomorphs from safety as she learns the pattern of when they patrol the facility. And this leads up to the events when the colonial marines arrive on LV-426. Do you remember what Ash said about the xenomorph in the movie Alien? When he said, its structural perfection is matched only by its hostility. I admire its purity, a survivor, unclouded by conscience, remorse, or delusions of morality. The xenomorph's genetic makeup allows it to adapt to any environment, having acid for blood, a hard exoskeleton for armor, and the loyalty they have to their queen makes them the perfect organism. Ever since the Whaling Dutani Corporation heard about this alien species, they have been fascinated about it. When an alien was on board the Nostromo, their top priority was to bring back the alien life form, and the crew was expendable. It's not the first time Whaling Dutani has taken such an interest in the xenomorph. Now, there are stories where they try to weaponize them for military purposes and other stories where the xenomorph is completely robbed of its natural instincts and turned into an automated weapon. This brings us to the character General Thomas Spears. He was part of the story in Alien's Nightmare Asylum. There was a novel and also a comic book about this story. While not everything about him is mentioned in the comic book, some other details are given out in the novel. Nightmare Asylum was part of the Alien's novel trilogy. The story of Nightmare Asylum takes place after Alien's Earth Hive. The xenomorphs have infested Earth and have spread across the world, forcing humans to escape or die trying. The year was 2129, and Thomas Spears was born within an artificial womb, part of the military's birthing program. He was raised within the military and was trained to serve the corpse. During his early childhood, he would get bullied by an older cadet named Jericho. But around the age of nine, Thomas Spears would defend himself against him, and he took Jericho's life by using a knife. He did not think twice or show any signs of remorse. He was simply proud of his kill. When he reached the age of 15, Spears was showing to be a competent cadet and could possibly become a Marine in the future. While he was still in the military, he found himself attracted to Gunnery Sergeant Brandywine, who was twice his age, but they still shared an intimate encounter and because of this moment, he would always remember her. When he reached the rank of general, he now had the power to reach his ambition, to create an army of trained xenomorphs. They would be controlled by his command. He would bring them to Earth to fight against their brethren and reclaim Earth for mankind. Not only was his idea ludicrous, but there was no guarantee trained aliens would fight against the ones on Earth. As the story of Nightmare Asylum begins, it picks up where Alien's Earth Hive left off. The survivors of the previous story are Wilkes, Billy, and the android Bueller. Having made it out of Earth, they drift through space in the American space vessel. It automatically has coordinates set for a military installation which is run by General Spears. Billy ends up having a nightmare of an alien and fears there's one on board the ship. This actually ends up being true. Billy and Wilkes deal with the aliens by using their limited weapon supply and using the airlock and also the thrusters of the ship to shoot them off into space. When they board the military station, they are greeted by General Spears, but he greets them very rudely. Spears is a type of man who puts a lot of focus on his mission. Survivors are not his priority. Instead, he shows great concern in the alien species that were lost. General Spears would keep his agenda a secret, performing experiments on aliens to harness and control their behavior. He truly believed this species could be controlled, like all the other grunts under his command. He admired them, not for their violent nature, but for their loyalty and devotion to their queen. Compared to the xenomorphs, humans are frail and weak, but xenomorphs have the strength and power of true soldiers. They are loyal and serve without question. They just lack leadership, and Spears has the dream of leading aliens into battle under his command. While most of the men under his command would follow his orders, some of them thought the general was insane, and any traitor who was caught would end up with a severe punishment, they would just disappear. The general would even go as far as taking the civilian terraforming base and turning it into a breeding station. At first, the colonists would fight back, 
but then they all eventually became test subjects for the xenomorphs. Part of the general's birth process is hinted in one scene. He mentions how he was not born naturally, he feels he's missing something, and it's what the aliens share above all else, the bond of flesh. It's also mentioned how he lied to the colonists. He said a viral bacteria had formed from the terraforming process. This was a way to place the colonists into separate quarantine cells. It was later revealed that the queen would communicate to her drones through an empathetic mental link. The testing began almost immediately, and every available colonist was used for science. When a xenomorph killed a human, they would burn it, and the queen would watch her children incinerate in front of her. General Spears would use this method as a way of communicating with the Queen, and it worked. The Queen seemed to understand. When he showed her the flame on his lighter, the Queen would order her drones not to attack. After each test session, selective drones were removed from the physical proximity of the Queen, but the aliens escaped later on, only to be pushed into the ship's holding pen by the use of a flamethrower. Spears believes they understand the flame. It was a way to reason with the queen before, so maybe it still works. The aliens ended up escaping because of the actions of Billy, Wilkes, Bueller, and Powell, who was working for Spears, but has now joined the others who want to stop the general. By this time, the insanity of General Spears really starts to show, when he chooses his mission over the lives of his own men, burning them as he leaves the base with the aliens and its queen on board, only saying a crew would only complicate matters, so he chose to continue his mission alone. When he approaches Earth, he's so lost in his own dream, believing the aliens will follow his orders. He thinks he can only trust the xenomorphs, because their loyalty transcends human treachery. When he lands on Earth, he releases the aliens on board his ship, but something unexpected happens. They do not follow his orders. Then they try to attack him, but he defends himself. In the end, his insane mission was a failure. All he did was aid the queen to rejoin her children on Earth. General Spears tries to fight her off, but she ends his life with a head bite. His revolution ended before it had a chance to begin. Right before he lost his life, General Spears would use his flamethrower on the Queen Alien, and she burns away in front of her children. This story ends with Ripley making an appearance which leads into the next book, but it's later revealed this is not the real Ripley, it's just an android version of her. While the comic book and novel have mostly the same story, there are a few differences between them. For example, Spears has a different death scene by the Queen Alien. When he tries to train the Queen, instead of incinerating a warrior alien to control her, he tries to destroy her eggs instead. When the Queen and the other xenomorphs escape, one version has them accidentally released by someone loyal to General Spears, and the other version has Spears releasing them himself. While he may not be the only character who wanted to control the Xenomorphs, General Spears was not following orders from someone above him. His mission was a delusional dream of being the so-called savior of Earth. The man suffered from paranoia and ran his army with an iron fist. Having no sympathy for his actions, sacrificing humans in the name of science, and even risking the lives of his own men, the only thing that mattered to him was reaching his goal. There are a bunch of characters within the Alien and Predator universe that are very interesting, and I've covered them in separate videos, either through the comic books, movies, novels, or video games. I will leave a few links so you can check them out. Now, when it comes to the lore on these two franchises, there's a lot of differences and scale between them to how far some stories can go. While the comic books are very ambitious, not everything you can read there can be fully accepted by the fans. There's a lot of things I covered within the Alien and Predator universe, so look around my channel and enjoy. Hey, what's up everyone, Carlos here. So I wanted to go over Parker's original death scene in the first Alien movie and how different it is from the final version. So this scene underwent some changes in the script and along with some ideas that Ridley Scott had in mind through his drawings. Now the scene we got in the film took place when the Alien tracks down Lambert and approaches her. As Lambert is too scared to move, Parker rushes into her aid, but the alien turns around and hits him with its tail. Parker goes flying into a wall, then the alien grabs his head, squeezes it, and kills him with its inner jaw. Now this scene was entirely different through the drawings that Ridley Scott made for this scene. It took place when both Parker and Lambert were suited up and equipped with flamethrowers. The two of them would search for the alien, only for it to appear behind Parker. The alien picks him up and kills him instantly in one hit but Lambert actually fights back in the scene by using the flamethrower on it. 
but the alien holds Parker's body up as a shield and walks through the flames toward Lambert. This scene was changed slightly later on. When Parker gets jumped by the alien, it takes a bite out of him, just enough to keep him alive. But as he knows he's going to die, he calls out for Lambert to use the flamethrower on him and the alien. As Lambert is unable to kill her friend, she eventually comes around and burns Parker alive. And another version of this scene was similar to the final cut, but this time, when Parker gets close to the alien, he uses the flamethrower as a club and hits the alien with it, but it has no effect on it. The alien turns around, strikes Parker once, and kills him instantly, although it does not say what the alien used to kill Parker with in this scene. So this scene was changed slightly again in another version. When Parker rushes the alien, it turns around and hits him with its tail. Parker goes flying into the wall, and his head hits the wall at the same time, and he gets disorientated. So because of this, he does not face the alien as it picks him up. The alien would then slam Parker up against the wall, and as he is still knocked out, the alien squeezes his head and then kills him. Now we can see how there were different takes on this scene. Ridley Scott did mention in the past that he wanted to keep the alien a mystery in this movie just by showing less of it. So I can see how these extra scenes just would have ended up showing too much of the alien's body. But I actually would have liked to see this scene based off Ridley's drawings where the alien uses Parker's body as a shield against Lambert's flamethrower as it advances towards her. It sounds like something different from all the other deaths in the movie and I wouldn't mind seeing it. The Aliens movie introduced us to The Power Loader, a mechanical exoskeleton controlled by a human and designed for lifting heavy objects. The machine can multiply a human operator's strength. Its overall lifting capacity would be around 4,000 kilograms. Even though the machine is very slow, Ripley did use it to fight against a queen alien. But there are other suits within the Alien universe. The one I want to look at for this video are the Berserker Combat Units. They were operated by the Whalen yutani Corporation and usually sent on missions involving a lot of xenomorphs. But unlike the power loaders, the Berserker units were designed for combat and sent in alone. Various units would weigh anywhere from 2 to 10 metric tons. Both their left and right arm would be equipped with powerful weapons like a flamethrower, an electro prod, pulse rifles with chemicals meant to neutralize the xenomorph acid blood, and grenade launchers. The armor plating on these units would be acid resistant. This was to protect it from the xenomorph's acid blood. So by now, you might be thinking, this is the perfect weapon against the aliens. Well, it does come with a few design flaws. The first problem is that it required a human operator to volunteer. And once they were placed inside the unit, they were almost never able to come out. Whoever was assigned to operate a Berserker unit would spend most of their time inside it. When no mission was assigned to the team, the pilot was placed in a coma through the use of sedatives. But when they needed to turn the Berserker on, it was pumped with a triple dose of synthetic adrenaline. This would supercharge the pilot right before it was sent in to deal with the alien swarm. The pilot within the Berserker unit would have to link up with the machine in a special way. A set of probes were drilled into the back of their brain. This gave them control over the machine's movements. Then, the advanced computer program would automate its actions such as aiming and tracking targets. The overall experience was so painful that most operators would succumb to injuries or adrenaline overdose and expire. So you could say berserker units were kind of like cyborgs, the merging of machine and flesh. While they were very efficient at destroying a lot of aliens during a mission, their uncontrollable rampage would sometimes result in friendly fire. They were truly a weapon of pure destruction, but at the cost of a human life. One specific unit was in the comic book story Aliens Frenzy. A special team is assigned to wipe out the alien hive on a space station. DS Service Terminal 949 was their target but it had the largest amount of xenomorphs they have ever encountered. An alien infestation occurred when they escaped from a transport ship. But something about the mission is not right. Executive Vice President Mr. A. Grigson orders the team to not call for any backup. No outsiders are allowed on this mission, so the team assigned here, well, they're on their own. But of course, they have to secure the space station so they cannot nuke it. As the story unfolds, it's revealed that essential data must be recovered from the space station. 
They want to know what went wrong, and with no backup being sent in, the team is expendable. The Berserker unit part of this team was simply named Max, which stood for Mobile Assault Exo Warrior. Things turn for the worse when the pilot of Max passes away, so the technician Ellis makes the ultimate sacrifice. He boards Max and takes over its controls. He's fully aware of how it operates and eventually is able to adjust to its interface. He saves the rest of the team within the hive and even takes out a queen alien. When the survivors make it to the primary console, they begin transferring the ship's data log to the nemesis where the commander is waiting for them. But still, something does not seem right. He betrays his team, locks them in the space station and plans to leave no evidence to incriminate the company. He is simply following orders from those above him. As he sets off the reactor to blow up in 12 minutes, he tries to persuade Laura to abandon her team and come with him. But a facehugger jumps him and Laura uses this chance to run off and help her team. Only three survivors make it out as the base explodes, but Ellis has suffered a severe amount of mental and physical pain in the Mac suit. Their story is later tied to Machiko Noguchi around the time she joined a new Predator clan. But after some time with them, the only thing she feels is being alone. Before she left Ryushi, she brought a device that could pick up transmission signals in space. But all it did was remind her of the distance she put between herself and humanity. As the Nemesis ship drifts through space with no fuel, they're able to reach a base through a distress signal. A ship is dispatched by Bunda Survey and sent out to their location for assistance. Meanwhile, the commander of Bunda Survey contacts Mr. Briggs. Before he arrives there, he shares a code word with Kevin Vincent. The word is Cancer Black. When the survivors make it to Bunda, they are quarantined right away because of reports that came from a space station infested with aliens. Alice then brings up what happened on Terminal 949. The data they retrieved is very important to somebody. Perhaps this person believes the survivors might know what's inside the data. Mr. Briggs later reveals that the data they took was about using Terminal 949 as a test site. They wanted to know how fast an alien infestation would spread through an isolated community. Cancer Black was a reference to the black aliens and how they infest and take over an area. But this is when the Bunda survey station is attacked by a group of predators. During all the chaos happening on the base, someone sends out a distress signal and it is picked up by Machiko Noguchi. Troubled by her time spent with the predators, she chooses humans and comes up with a plan to leave. She ends up slaying a few clan members and then steals a ship. When she arrives on the planet, she tries to help out the survivors and escape. But things turn for the worse when they are surrounded by predators and aliens along with their queen. Their chances of survival are low, but they are saved by Ellis who is now inside the Mac suit. Despite the trauma he suffered earlier, he is willing to endure it once again to save his friends. But as they leave the planet, they decide to leave the Max armor suit behind. Briggs was inside it. To exact revenge for being face hugged, he made the most of the little time he had left. The story of Alien's Frenzy started off as a comic book, but was later adopted to a novel called Alien's Berserker. I also want to point out something that's on the cover of the comic book. If you zoom in on the pilot, the facial features don't even look human. The Berserker unit Max would later appear in the comic story Alien vs Predator 3 World War. It continues the story of Machiko Noguchi, but Max is only shown in a flashback scene. Another version of a Berserker suit was in the graphic novel called Aliens Tribes back in 1992. A squad of marines was sent to a medical research space station called Todd Lab XLI to eliminate a xenomorph infestation. They brought with them the Mach 16 Berserker which ends up fighting against a queen alien. Many aliens get taken out but the queen gets her throat blasted by a grenade launcher. The Mach 16 is destroyed by the end of the story when aliens sacrifice themselves. Their acid blood burns through the interior, this would end up depressurizing the entire station. When multiple baby boomer explosions go off, the Mach 16 is pulled back into its blast radius and destroyed, but there were some survivors aboard a ship that made it out in time. This graphic novel also mentions something about the pilot being kept in a coma. If they are allowed to dream for too long, it could have a negative effect when they wake them up for combat. 
The pilot might still have visions of their dream. There's no telling what they would do at this time. But on one occasion, this resulted in the accidental death of another team member. After I finished the whole story and looking over the design of the Berserker combat unit, now I can see why they were given that specific name. The large doses of synthetic adrenaline causes the pilot to go berserk. So that covers the Berserker units in the Aliens universe. What happens when the alien takes you into the hive? Well, judging from what we saw in the movies and comic books, this usually means you're going to become a host for a face hugger. You're placed either in a wall or floor covered in a sticky substance, which prevents you from escaping. The Xenomorph is known to be very hostile and aggressive, but there was a very unique story about the Xenomorph's actions within the hive. This occurred in the comic book Aliens Labyrinth. While most of the story focuses on Dr. Paul Church's experiments on aliens, there is a section of the story that goes deep into how he survived his time within the alien hive, and the events that unfold give us a deeper look into the Xenomorph's behavior. It was 32 years ago, and Paul Church was only 20 years old at the time. His parents were terraformers, and along with the crew and synthetic, they all spent most of their time aboard the ship called the Incunabulum. Ever since he was a teenager, Paul Church wanted to be a scientist. He even got a small grant from the government. His work was around immunization research. Before they headed back to RLW-1289, the ship had to make one stop on the moon that was terraformed 15 years ago. It was a routine mission, so no trouble was expected. Upon landing, they noticed another ship was already here, possibly for quite some time. And without warning, aliens would swarm the group and they get abducted. The crew is brought into the hive. The aliens would sniff, lick, and probe them. They never heard of alien behavior like this, so this was indeed very strange and different. As everyone was separated, Paul Church was brought into the bowels of the hive, only for his eyes to see what happened to the crew from the other ship. Their bodies were bloated, mutilated, and hung all over the place. It's possible that some of them were still breathing. As Paul was strung up against the wall with some sticky substance, he was sure the aliens would return to end his life. But then, the most unexpected thing happened next. One alien would use the bloated bodies as a food source, and this was fed to Paul to keep him alive. This was one of the many strange behaviors the Xenomorph had displayed, and it certainly would not be the last. After spending so much time in the hive, Paul was beginning to give up on any hope of escape. He longed for the moment of death. He didn't even notice they carried him somewhere else. Inside the breeding pen, he found Lewis Clark. She was still alive, barely. Her stomach was swollen, and right then, she gave birth to a new alien species. But these ones were different, but also inadequate. As they did not survive more than an hour, the aliens were trying to create more of their kind because something was wrong in the hive. Paul was later taken to that chamber with the sticky pool he saw earlier, and without hesitation, he emulated the aliens, taking the fluid into his mouth and feeding it to one of the mutilated bodies. His action persuaded the aliens that he was no longer a threat. Paul would make use of this freedom by gathering knowledge within the hive. He discovered the leech-like things in the fluid secreted a solvent which the aliens used as a medicine. He also found a black mold that was destroying the aliens. Paul had found something he could use against them. If things could not get any stranger, Paul was later brought to see his mother. The aliens wanted him to mate with his mother. But instead, he did the only thing he could do. He took her life. His actions were not favored by the aliens, and so he was taken away for embryo implantation. The sickness running through the hive even affected the facehuggers, to a point where they needed assistance. As the black mold spread through the hive, one by one, the aliens would not survive. Paul used this chance to escape once and for all. Now aboard his ship, which is still functional with power, the calendar showed he was gone for a total of 43 days, and so he sent out a distress signal. He then cleansed his body in 4 hours and patched his wounds. By using the ultrasound, he examined the alien larva in his chest. It was now dead and rotting. He had to remove it somehow. 
Paul had no surgical experience at all, but he used the information and tools he could get and set to work. The operation took seven hours, but was a complete success. One month later, a rescue party arrived. The smugglers were the ones responsible for the hive. The company considered his experience most valuable, so Paul was compensated for what he went through and then received a full biomechanical makeover and has studied aliens ever since. Despite his rather harsh and strict way of running his facility, Dr. Paul Church was a brilliant scientist. His discoveries gave us details on various topics around the xenomorph. For example, aliens tend to expire if they are removed from their clan for long periods of time. A xenomorph would choose survival over a food source, and when presented with food or a means of escape, they would feed and even bathe in the victim's remains. But gorging in its weakened state could lead to the alien not surviving, so it was limited to how much it could eat. Aliens would almost always attack a target that is perceived as a threat. Since aliens have a way of communicating telepathically, they also have a way of sensing the fear in other animals. During the dissection of an alien, he discovered the alien can pick up E-waves. This was the reason they were affected by electromagnetic fields. The dorsal area was suspected to be what the alien has instead of a brain, because the skull was full of organs. Dr. Church was trying to find a way of domesticating the aliens to tame them and control them. So that covers the story of some very unusual xenomorph behavior and how Dr. Paul Church survived his time within the alien hive. It also marks one of the few times someone has survived an alien chestburster. I want to know what you thought about how the xenomorphs acted in this story. Put your thoughts in the comments section. When it comes to movies in the film industry, what you see as the final product is not always the first idea brought to light on a franchise. The alien movies have a history of multiple versions of a script being brought up, but many of them being turned down. While not every script has the best ideas to continue the alien legacy, they can, however, give us alternate stories of different characters. And one of those scripts that I wanted to look at was one written by William Gibson. The original story he came up with was in 1987. It had no resemblance to the Alien 3 movie and script we have now. Instead, it was continuing the story of Corporal Hicks, Newt, and Bishop. They would battle a new type of xenomorph that was genetically altered. This all took place aboard the space station called Anchor Point. The first draft included a lot of aliens with intense action scenes, similar to the movie Aliens, so it was redone with some drastic changes. In his second draft, William Gibson would now present a story with fewer aliens and a slower pace to the film, mixed with some claustrophobic horror. While both versions had a set of unique ideas, the studio would turn him down. He was one of many writers to never see his story hit the big screen. However, in 2018, his script was adapted into a comic book series called Alien 3, the unproduced screenplay, and in 2019, an audio drama of the same script was released by Audible. Both sources show us an alternate story of what could have happened in Alien 3, but was never shown to us until now. The story continues after the Aliens movie. We see the USS Sulaco, the ship containing the survivors from Aliens, all of them placed into hypersleep capsules. Due to navigational software failure, the Sulaco has entered territory claimed by the Union of Progressive Peoples. A team from the UPP approaches the Sulaco and plans to board it, before it leaves their sector in about 14 minutes. The UPP crew would explore the Sulaco. They switch to night vision while being heavily armed. As they look around, they come across the severed lower body of Bishop. Afterwards, they would go into the hypersleep vault. There, they see three capsules, while the fourth one seems to have a malfunction. As they open it, the rest of Bishop's body is found, but there's also something else inside, an alien egg. According to the story on Audible, Bishop, who is voiced by Lance Henriksen, he explains how this is possible. Before Ripley fought the alien queen in the Sulaco, the queen was able to deposit her last egg within Bishop's chest cavity, a barely viable organism which has grown to maturity within his hypersleep pod. The facehugger within then jumps onto Kurtz. 
and while his team shoots the facehugger, its acid blood melts the faceplate. It then finds its way to his face. Kurtz would then run away into the docking bay. With their time running out, only two of them manage to leave the Salako, leaving behind Kurtz, but taking the body of Bishop with them. The Salako would then dock with the Anchor Point Cluster. Here, we meet Jackson, Tully, and Spence. Jackson informs them that the Salako left Gateway four years ago with a crew of about 15, but when it returned, there were only three. Another priority shuttle out of Gateway had docked right before the Salako arrived. Two military science passengers were on board. They requested the Salako to be examined for biohazard contamination. Colonel Rossetti would then meet Kevin Fox and Susan Wells, the two military science personnel. Rossetti would question the reason for being there, which is to investigate the accidental failure in the ship's navigational system. Suspicions come up when Rossetti looks at their departure date. If the navigational system had malfunctioned on the Salako, why did Fox and Wells leave Gateway before it happened? Did they know it was going to malfunction? The secret to all of this is that the company caused the navigational failure by deliberately changing the route on the Salako. It was to go through the UPP sector, then brought to Anchor Point. They were well aware of what was on board the Salako. It carried specimens of weapons-related material. It became evident that the material in question had become active. Fox and Wells would participate in the sweep of the Salako. They were keen to know every detail about the Salako. It's not long until they find Bishop's lower body along with Newt. Ripley would suddenly scream and come out of her hypersleep pod, possibly going through nightmares. She lunges at the team but is held down and sedated. After this, the team would find the UPP member who was attacked by the facehugger earlier. His body is then taken to the med lab morgue to be examined. Meanwhile, Bishop's upper body was taken to UPP Rodina space station. They go through his memory in search of anything valuable. All of the information of Hadley's hope within his database is extracted. Corporal Hicks and Newt are then brought into the story a bit more. They meet Spence and see Ripley later on, but she's still sleeping after going into catatonic shock. Back on the UPP Rodina station, the data about the xenomorph from Bishop's memory is discussed. Everything about its life cycle, the Nostromo, Hadley's hope, all of it, is now known to the UPP. It also mentions that the host's DNA combines with the creature's genetic code to determine the resulting offspring. The creature is both sexless and self-replicating. Bishop proposes that each individual xenomorph has the genetic information to become a queen. This reproductive mode is somehow triggered by the proximity of an adequate number of host organisms. So in other words, a single egg leads to a single xenomorph and then a queen. That is, of course, if there are enough hosts within a certain range. Any type of experimentation with alien genetic material would violate biological warfare limitations in the treaty agreed by everyone. But it seems the whaling Utani Corporation has already broken this rule. So to buy themselves time, they repair Bishop's body and return it to Anchor Point and pretend to know nothing of the aliens. Nobody will know the access to Bishop's memories. Tully and Spence would show Fox what they discovered about the alien cells, which were taken from Bishop's lower body. After it made contact with human DNA, it pulls itself into the double helix. The two structures would mesh together, which results in a hybrid. The process happens very quickly. Now, back in the UPP Rodina lab, they examine a genetically modified alien. They are impressed by its many features, like how fast its cells multiply and how its gene structure had been designed for ease of manipulation. This alien species is so unique that it has universal compatibility with other plasms. They were cloning the xenomorph within a nutrient solution. They believe this alien is a weapon, the fruit of some ancient experiment, a living artifact, the product of genetic engineering. Perhaps what they are looking at is the result of someone else's arms race, a weapon created by someone a long time ago. We later see the embryos kept by the science team on the anchor point. The pressure would suddenly rise within the stasis tubes and burst through the glass. 
but these embryos were different. They opened up and released a mist into the air, then it evaporated. Wells had asked Tully about it, but he didn't see it, so he had no idea. For most of the story, the alien that emerged from Kurtz was still on the Salako. It was hiding within a damaged unit, and when it was replaced, this is how it ended up on the anchor point. When the Salaka was prepared to leave, Newt would board it and Hicks would stay behind. Newt would return to Oregon and stay with relatives. Back on the UPP Rodina station, their experiments with cloning aliens seems to have backfired. An alien outbreak would occur later on. Any survivors within would try to fight off the xenomorph. Hicks, Spence, and Bishop would then agree to destroy the clone embryos on Anchor Point, only for Wells to show up with Rossetti. But unknown to her, the mist from the embryo in the incident earlier has already started to take an effect on her. She would then go through some type of metamorphosis. She was turning into an alien from underneath. Bishop said it was through an airborne process. It looked different. He called it a hybrid. While Ripley's presence in the story was only brief, she was seen near the end. But to protect her from the alien, Hicks would send her off into space within a lifeboat. While the UPP Rodina station is under a xenomorph attack, only one survivor makes it out, Chang. Right before they sent a coded transmission to the battlecruiser Nikolai Stoiko, the alien is ejected into space and she escapes. So now we have one xenomorph drone and one hybrid on anchor point. And as for Tully, he managed to freeze himself to prevent exposure to others. Fox had also destroyed the lifeboats and broadcast connection to prevent anyone from leaving and calling for help. The hybrid alien ends up biting Tatsumi on the leg and infects him at the same time. Because it was a new variant of the alien, this caused the mutation to occur rapidly, but he gets eliminated by Hicks, who used a weapon taken from Kurtz. The hybrid does meet up with the other alien. A battle occurs between them, but it ends quickly. The alien slashes at the hybrid's face, then lifts it up and rips it in half. They open the airlock, trying to send the alien into space. But when the door opens, Commander Chang from the Rodina station shows up. She opens fire with her ship and blasts the alien apart. The ending shows the survivors escaping anchor point just in time before it blows up. Bishop tells them, you can be united against a common enemy. You'll have to trace the xenomorph back to the point of origin. So the first thing I want to point out is the idea of an airborne virus to create a new type of alien. This idea was used in Alien Covenant. This in turn created the Neomorph in the movie. If you look at the script from William Gibson in 1987 for his version of Alien 3 and John Logan in 2015 for Alien Covenant, they both show a similarity when it comes to the mist emitting from an embryo or egg. Perhaps that's why they used a picture of a Neomorph for the picture on Audible, to give a sense of connection between the old script in 1987 and the movie Alien Covenant. The other similarity was that we got to see two different types of aliens in both stories. The unproduced screenplay had a hybrid alien, while Alien Covenant introduced the Neomorph. The last thing that linked these two stories together is when the UPP personnel would examine the alien's genetic code, saying that this creature was a product of genetic engineering. This could be a reference to how the engineers created an early version of an alien creature long ago. This was depicted in the murals within Prometheus, or how David would create another version of the xenomorph in Alien Covenant. Overall, the message is very clear. Xenomorphs were created by someone. So that covers the Alien 3 story by William Gibson. Do you think his idea would have made a better movie? Or do you feel the movie we got in the end was the best version? Tell me in the comments section. I also want to mention there were multiple writers that tried to make a story for Alien 3, but a lot of them got turned down. But this is one rare occasion when an unproduced screenplay gets brought up as a comic book. Now if you want to see more lore around the Alien universe, then subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching and supporting my videos. My name is Carlos or Acid Glow, and I'll see you in the next video.